Gary Beers, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Rick. How are you? Uh, good man. Uh, what was the spark that lit your flame for music in the first place? Um, ironically, I mean, yeah, growing up, it was it was um, just my love of the bands I heard. I mean, growing up, hearing all the great bands as, as a kid, like Zeppelin, the Beatles, and to a degree, the Monkees, you know, because they had great songs, and um, and then you know, later on, Queen, and just being around when all that music was on Australian radio. I mean, because Australian radio had no format, so you had Motown followed by ACDC, followed by Queen, um, you know, and you, you couldn't help but, but fall in love with music. And ACDC played at my school dance, so I really was a goner by then. That's funny because the first band I saw was at my school was ACDC. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So the first instrument was a bass. No, I played. Um, I bought an acoustic guitar, and I had about a you know, paid for my own lessons and. Got to a point where the, the teacher was this cranky old old bastard, and he he actually asked me, "Do I really want to play guitar? It was that bad." And then I lost a bet with my two best friends at school, um, and the bet was whoever knew the least chords would buy a bass. So I knew the least chords, so I lost the bet, but you know, bought bought a bass and became the only bass player in the area. So um, lucked out. Yeah, uh, there were a few bands before you met. Andrew Farris, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the Farris brothers, which became in excess. Uh, back in those early days, what were the goals? Just have fun. <clears throat> I mean, everything was, was a learning curve. I mean, we never, I'd never played with anybody. I was in a, those two friends that I, that I, they kept playing guitar and I played bass. And we just sat around doing covers, never, you know, nothing original, no drummer. Um, just sitting and you know, walking around in each other's, in, in, just sitting in each other's bedrooms and playing. And then I met Andrew Farris at a, you know, at a, at a, at Bulgola Surf Club. And um, next day I was jamming with him and, and John Farris on drums. So, um, and that's the first time I played with a drummer was that day. And I just, it was a, a magical, mystical experience. Cause I, you know, I just completely um, got lost in that. And then bass, play, playing bass made sense all of a sudden. So, um, it all just became about you know meeting new friends because Andrew and I are still best mates, and then um, and just going on a musical journey together. Yeah. First time I saw you guys, uh, <coughs> I think it was the Grain Store Tavern in Melbourne. Um, I don't remember it well. No, I, I think you might have had the the Simple Simon single out. Oh God, yeah. Might have been even a little bit later than that. Yeah. But the work ethic in those days, the the rehearsal regime. It was crazy. I mean. Rehearsals were, you know, we, we do rehearsals, but rehearsals were basically on stage, you know, because we did a lot of, you know, making up as we go along stuff. We really learnt to play, mainly, except, except for mainly John. John was always, the drummer was always, even at, when I met him, he was 11. He was incredible. Like, he's always been incredible. He's a natural. Um, and Andrew, you know, learnt piano and stuff, but the rest of us were just all sort of winging it. Um, so we just make it up as we went along. None of us read, read music and still don't. I mean, Andrew might read a little bit, but um, yeah, we just, the work ethic was just get out there and play. And, and we really loved playing. So, and there was plenty of places to play. So we just, you know, played everywhere we could in Sydney. Um, and then as soon as the world opened up as far as Melbourne and, and Adelaide, we just jump on the car and go, you know, drive to a, a simple drive, you know, overnight down to Melbourne. You know, nearly dying every time on the Hume Highway and then cross Adelaide and just play and play. Yeah. Uh, then you be began to have hit uh, ones like Shabu Shabar and the, the Swing and, and hits in Australia. Um, when did the attention turn to America? Pretty much um, when we were doing uh, Shabu Shabar, we were setting up to, you know, to write Shabu Shabar. We, we started off with, we did the one thing. And we did that with Mark Opitz, and um, and I, yeah, John and I had worked with with Mark Opitz earlier. Um, he when we played on Richard a Richard Clapton album, The Great Escape. So we'd met Mark and knew Mark was you know, yeah, and at the time he was and still is the top Australian producer, and um, and we were looking for a good producer. And then we did the one thing with him, and then Andrew, Michael, and Kirk jumped on a plane for the first time in in. In, you know, in the band's lives and went to America and Europe looking for producers and everyone that they played the one thing to said, why are you looking for a producer? Do that, you know? So 
went back and did Shibusha Bar with Mark, and that's when we realised that we're you know, songwriting wise and sound wise we're onto something finally, and, and that's when you know, you know especially with the, the guidance of Chris Murphy, our manager, that we looked started looking in America because history at that time was that all Australian bands make it big in Australia, then look at America. And by that time, they're, they're probably a little bit too proud and established to go and start all over again. And we were just starting to get there in Australia, but we just really feel, figured it was time to, you know, while well, we're still hungry to get out there and into America. And yeah. everyone, and most Australian bands go to England or Europe. And we just, we grew up on Motown and American funk, you know, like the bands like Little Feet and Funkadelic, and we just really wanted to get there and sort of absorb that. Yeah. Uh, then came the, the Kick album and, and What You Need, the single. Um, you were basically one of the biggest bands in the world uh, at the time. Were you able to take that in and really enjoy it or, or was, were you too focused on the next thing? Um, always focused. I mean, and, and the funny thing is that Australia's got this wonderful thing called the tall poppy syndrome. So every time we go home, we downplay what we just did, you know, like... Um, you know, we, we spent the entire gate playing Wembley Stadium on filming it with 16 35 mil cameras and helicopters and the whole deal, and we never released it. We just sat on it for years until finally we just thought, hang on, we should release that. And um, just because the perception of, in Australia of success is, just, is, is so back to front. I mean, you know, Australians tend to worship overseas bands having success in Australia, but not Australian bands. And we kind of weathered the, the, the tall poppy thing in Australia a couple of times. Um, so we just go home and just you know, melt into our lives as much as we could, um, knowing full well that we just sold out Wembley Stadium and, and uh, you know, three nights at Madison Square Garden or whatever. And, you know, um, and it will have, had hit singles in Japan and France and Holland. And uh, you know, we, had, we were the biggest selling band ever in Canada for quite a while. Um, and we just go home and just just get back to life, you know. And I, I think, which is, I think helped us stay grounded as we went along, because we really just wanted to make it about the music, not about sales or or perception of how big we were, because you know that's that doesn't last very long. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Webley. I wanted to mention a couple of key moments in the band's career. What are your memories of the Wembley gig? Um, being a nervous wreck beforehand, because. You know, we that was um, we just released X, the album after Kick, um, and we'd done extensive rehearsals for a, the big X tour. In we did rehearsed in I think it was Birmingham, so we had it was an amazing light show. Great, you know, the great crew, um, and we had some time off. Then we just did a short run of European festivals, so it was only like two week run as opposed to our usual twelve to eighteen months run. So we were pretty fresh by the time we hit Wembley, and but still, Wembley is—it's Wembley. It's it's mythical for any Australian act, and we we sort of over the years we played Wembley Arena, which holds ten thousand people. So it's just like I guess like um, you know, um, yeah, it's a it's a and it's right across the road from Wembley Stadium. So every time you go to the back door of Wembley Arena, and we I think the last the, the time. The last tour before we played Wembley Stadium, we did, I think, seven nights there. So we played the same amount of people at Wembley Arena, but every time you go to the back door and you look at the stadium and you think, you know, um, you know we want to play there. And we, we had played there once with Queen. We, we sort of took the offer to, to jump on as an opening band for Queen and Status Quo just after Live Aid when Queen and you know, did the reinvented themselves with the most amazing performance. So we had played Wembley Stadium and, and lived, you know. And so we were keen to, really keen to get back there and, and headline our own show, which I don't think any Australian band had done. So, um, yeah, that was, that was our goal, was to sell it out. Yeah, uh, another big moment uh, was the MTV Awards and you performed New Sensation. Um, probably one of the most exciting TV performances I've seen from a band. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you remember that? And did that performance have any effect on the band afterwards? Um, not really. I mean, we 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 were doing TV shows all over America, like Letterman, and and um, we did a great 
um, live at the Hard Rock um, concert that was filmed, at, you know, just before we did MTV. And MTV was, was um, you know, we won all those awards, which was amazing. I think we won seven MTV awards. But my memory of it is that we all had the awards in our hands and we're going to, after the show, going to a stage to do an interview for the world press. And someone with a really bad Australian accent goes, excuse me, mate, can I take that? And it was Robin Williams grabbed my award and got up on stage with in excess as me, or as, as an Australian guy at the end. And so all the guys got up there and got have awards and they go, Who's, Robin Williams is on stage and he just completely stole the show. So our, our, yeah, our moment of glory as far as videos go was um, Robin Williams just being himself. But, and I, I didn't get on stage. I'm like, I got to watch Robin Williams on stage with in excess. It was brilliant. So um, that's my fondest memory of that night. But it was amazing. You know, it was just great to get recognition, and especially for people like Richard Lowenstein, who's been our video guy forever. I mean, you know, um, we learned to make videos early on because it's. You know, I think all Australian bands learned to make videos because it was so hard to, you know, get to other countries. You had to you had to make videos. Yeah, uh, Michael Hutchins, mm -hmm. uh, one of the greatest uh, frontmen in the world mm -hmm. and uh, the front men of your band. Um, when you think back at Michael, what are the strongest memories? Um, you know, it's, it's funny because obviously everyone um, perceives Michael, and rightly so, as, as one of the greatest you know, live performers and sex gods or whatever you want to call it. You know, he was, you know, but I remember Michael as you know, starting out with all of us and he was the, the new guy with bad complexion and greasy hair and, and he, more, so, more than any of us, he was learning his trade. Um, he was, you know, because he was in a band with Andrew and I um, called Dr. Dolphin and then yeah, that band, <coughs> that, sorry, that band led into Ferris Brothers with the other guys and he was really learning his lyric writing and his song and his, his vocals during that phase. So, um, and I just remember Michael as a mate, as an as a absolute sweetheart and a really good guy. And very down to earth and, and, and so I got to see the side of Michael that you know not many people saw and obviously you know we've been together since high school so we're all very comfortable with each other three brothers you know um, and basically six brothers you know because we all you know, sometimes the, the three non-brothers were more cl you know closer to the actual brothers than, than the real brothers because brothers do, you know, do, do what brothers do but um, and you know a bunch of Australian blokes just traveling the world together you know, um, looking after each other because you know, we, we know all know the horror stories of of bands and egos and drugs and this and that and we we're always there for the music. So my fondest memory of Michael is just is him being the consummate professional, going up there and singing his heart out and and just giving the crowd the performance of a life. You know, like something they'll always remember. He was that good. So, but and then off stage he's just a sweetheart, telling jokes. Yeah. You know, just being Michael. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your gear journey. Um, for most of the in excess career, what was the uh, the rig, the bass, and amps? It changed. I, I started out, you know, worked with an Australian guy called um, David Peach, and he used to build me preamps and stuff. And then I worked with PV and um, worked with you know worked with them because when I worked with people, I tend I'm a, I did electronics. Um, after school and did woodwork during school, so I've always been a hands-on kind of techie. Um, and then I, I approached Ampeg and became best mates with Ted Kornblum, whose dad owned Ampeg. So I designed some, some cabinets for them and, and then got endorsed by Ampeg for a very long time. Um, and then, yes, since then, I've, I've worked with Trainer from Canada, I've worked with Laney from England, I just met um, Mark um, Gooday from from Ashtown, Ashtown um, and lovely bloke, and I'm probably going to work with them because um, I'm always looking for for the you know, the, the best bass gear, and they seem to be making the best bass gear at the moment. So, but I've always been a tube guy, and Ampeg was you know, was always my go-to stuff, but it's not quite the same as it used to be, sadly. Um, so yeah, I'm, um, it's through the the height of Inexcess, it was always. Ampeg and quite often Ampeg combined with with PV Black Widow speakers because to me they're still the best speakers ever made. Yeah, so now you've uh, created your own bass. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to do that? 
Um, this is the. This is it. Um, because I. Um, I had an amazing collection of basses and guitars in Australia, and then when I moved to America 18 years ago, I let all that go. And I moved to America with two basses. One's my 58 P bass, which is the NXS bass, I call it Old Faithful. And one's a 75 um, Music Man Stingray, so it's a first year Stingray um, that Leo Fender probably had his hands all over you know, being the first year model. And that's the only two basses I arrived in America with. So. And I, I, I retired Old Faithful many years ago, and I worked with a company called G&L, which is another guitar company. Um, but I really wanted to, I always had an idea for this pickup. So the pickup um, I've been working on for years, I, I patented. And um, patented it five years ago. I've been working on it for probably 20 years, the idea of the four coils, and then a passive circuit that can give you split humbucker, reverse split humbucker, full humbucker, and single and two single coils. So, um, and basically designed to feel and look like a, a vintage, like, a, like an old faithful P bass or jazz bass, or I have three different bass styles, four string, five string, fretless, fretted. Um, and I just wanted to build a bass that can get any sound you want without a battery, because I'm not a big fan of, of active basses. Um, that feels like an old friend. So um, I'm in the process, these are all the prototypes that I built and I've got a company in Carlsbad in California hand making the first batch. So they're making about 30 bases right now out of, with three different body styles and about five different colors to choose from. Yeah. Um, so what's the, uh, the goal with the, the base company? I don't know. I mean, they're, they're boutique bases, they're all, they're all handmade. Um, um, I guess you know it's just it's part of my journey because I, as I said, did electronics, did woodwork, played bass since you know since high school, um, played through every piece of equipment you can imagine, every foot effect. I mean, I I just need needed to to make a statement with the sound I wanted and the sound because you know I I like getting different sounds like the Motown bass sound, the pick aggressive pick sound. Um, Keyboard bass, I use keyboard bass a lot. So, and I've always tried different basses. I work with Steve Chick with the, the MIDI bass. But in the end of the day, I just like having one bass at a gig. That's it. I mean, I I don't like changing basses. So I wanted to get one bass that can get all the sounds I want. That the pickup's strong enough, vintage sounding, but strong enough to drive pedals. Um, and all in a, in a pretty sexy package. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they're, they're, I'm, Releasing the web, the website's coming out in about two weeks. I, you know, it, the website's actually building a website to me is harder than building a handmade bass. So yeah. I'm finally getting that happening. So, yeah. so new bass, new band. Yeah, I got a band called Ashen Moon um, with a fellow Aussie called Toby Rand. He's from Melbourne. He lives here as well. He was in a band called Duke Cartel, and we met um, at a party. Classic LA story. Met at a party of a mutual friend and end up jamming that night. And becoming you know, fast friends, and um, we sort of did some some corporate band cover band fun stuff for a while, and then finally we decided to write together. So we wrote an album. Um, he and I wrote it together. Um, I produced it. We recorded it at my house. I engineered it, and then um, COVID hit. So we we had it ready to go, beginning of 2020, and we ended up releasing four or five songs with videos that we made during COVID. So um, just, and we did acoustic versions of the songs as well, just because, you know, remotely, because we couldn't hang out. And then um, then we shelved it because, you know, COVID didn't seem, seem to want to be going away. So now that's hopefully done. We're, we're looking at, at getting Ash and Moon back out there this year. So we, we've got the full album we haven't released yet. So, um, and we've got a whole bunch of new material that we want to get in the studio, in my, in my new studio. and. and record and write so and finish off so uh, yeah this year Ash and Moon. Yeah. What are you most proud of in your career? Um, I don't know I mean that's a really good question um, I think still being alive <laughs> is a good one I mean lot, lost a lot of friends along the way including the obvious one with Michael um, but I'm just I'm just proud that I mattered 
as far as not just being a bass player, but being a, a band member of a great band, and that we mattered with a lot of people. I mean, we have a lot of fans still. Um, our music's, you know, mainly because of Andrew and Michael's writing. You know, I wrote a bit here and there, but mainly because of Andrew and Michael and the, the classic songs they wrote together, um, and the, the band playing them and, and touring them and making them famous, that's our legacy, and our legacy is a pretty good one. I mean, great songs, made a lot of people happy along the way, and still do. So that's, that's a pretty good thing to, to, to look back on and enjoy. Yeah. Gary Beards, thanks for your time. Thank you.